Hi there, I'm Mike Katz, Executive Vice President, T-Mobile for Business, and I wanted to welcome you to our new series, Taking Care of Business. Every single week, I'll be sitting down with business owners and discussing the shifts in their business and business model during this global pandemic. And man, I am really, really excited about our first episode here, uh, talking to the owner of Canlis. Canlis, if you haven't heard of it, is a Puget Sound, Seattle-based restaurant who is the winner of the 2019 and a nominee for the 2020 prestigious James Beard Award. And Seattle, uh, Candles has been an upscale, legendary dining experience for the past 70, 70 years. Uh, Mark Candles, who I have the pleasure of speaking with today, is a third generation owner and operator, and he has been able to shift the business model of Candles during Washington State's order for the closure of non-essential businesses. Mark knew he was facing a challenge like any, any other his business has ever seen or his family has ever seen. And I'm really, really excited, Mark, to get the chance to talk to you about what your business has done during this unbelievably unusual time. So uh, before we get started into like the, the real issue of the day, I just wanted to ask you first about uh, the idea and your thoughts about taking over a multi-generational business, because um, I know you're the, you're the third generation owner and there's... Uh, there's some cha there's some excitement. There's also challenges in taking over this multi-generational business. I'd, I'd love to just get your perspective on that. Yeah, there are my we we got 13 minutes. I have no <laughs> no idea how I can do that quickly. Um, here's the thing. I mean, as concisely as I can. I, I so I run this company with my brother, and we've been doing it now for 17 years. And um, it's a huge privilege. It's a huge honor. We didn't start this thing. It wasn't our idea. Uh, we can't be um, given credit for it necessarily, but uh, for the last, for that amount of time, we have loved it. And it's been, um, it's just been a privilege to get to shepherd something like that, to, to kind of come in. So my grandfather started in 1950, right? And my parents ran it for 30 years after him. And so to get to sort of build on their shoulders and to, uh, to carry a legacy on like that and then see what you can do with it. Um, and the first thing you try to do with it is not run into the ground. And we had, um, you know, <laughs> we took a go at that also. We made a ton of mistakes and uh, we've been fortunate to still be, to still be here. So this is, we are 70th birthday this December. So we're, we're pushing, we're going strong. Un unbelievable. And, you know, I think the adaptive, additive, uh, the adaptations you've shown during this, I think are probably, you know, a big, a big reason why. Speak, speaking of that, you know, going from a fine dining restaurant, which, uh, you know, no paid plug here, in my opinion, the, the best one in the Seattle area, but shifting your model from a fine dining restaurant into one that's doing exclusively takeout. Like, just, just talk us through that process. Like, how, how did that <laughs> You can that stand out loud. You can be like, yeah, man, that is crazy. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so... So when this thing whole kicked off, we sort of started to see the writing on the wall and just um, had the good fortune of meeting together as a team and saying, you guys, what does this mean? Um, and let's just throw everything out on the table. Like, like don't be scared to say it. And, um, and that it was a scary talk. There was a few hours of just coming to grips with the fact that Seattle didn't need fine dining. I mean, that was the bottom line. Like, okay, so we're 69 years into this thing and suddenly... Uh, the world takes a, a bit of a shift, and it's like I, I don't think we're I don't think we're serving anyone by staying open. I don't I don't think they need us, and so um, the the two roads there were just do we stay open or do we close? And um, at that time, so you got to remember this is pre uh, PPP money and pre sort of stimulus packages and sort of that kind of thing. Seattle's an amazing city to work in. We have, you know, we have. Uh, paid time off and sick leave and all these incredible things. But um, this decision was just to keep jobs. We have 115 employees. We think of ourselves as the model of inefficiency. Um, it's all we do is six nights a week serve dinner and it takes a lot of people to do that, or at least a lot for our little company. And it was just, what can we do to keep them employed? Is there anything we can do? And as you know, we're on a freeway, which for the first three generations of this company was a bit of a curse. No one wants to find any restaurant or freeway. Um, it's not like that sort of romantic ambiance you dream about, you know, taking your loved one to. But 
um, it just dawned on us like, hey, wouldn't this place make a killer drive through? And and so we just talked about it. Like, what if we just let out our inner drive through? Like, what if we just did this? And once those ideas started flowing, and once we kind of had uh, the courage to say, hey, I think we could stay open. I think we could pull this thing off. Um, we just ran with it and that turned into a bagel shed that we happened to have a shipping container with a pizza oven in it and, and an incredible woman who formerly was an expediter for us, but turns out to be an incredible baker. And so she's like, I can make the best bagel in town, which I know are fighting words. So we're not trying to pick a fight, but you know, we just wanted to give her a shot and, and, and those things sold out every morning at like an hour and the city was so um, just abundantly receptive and uh, gracious with us and trying to figure this thing out. And then we started the home delivery thing. So that, so three days in a row, we started three different businesses, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and the home delivery one is really the one that stuck and that was the most viable, particularly given as this whole thing progressed and from a health perspective, you know, just became more serious. And so it was the, it was the safest option for us. It definitely caused way less traffic. The drive through shut down large streets around us and we just thought um okay this is the way to do it so that's what we've been focusing on now yeah maybe, maybe the most important question if i go through the drive through to pick up food can i do it in my sweatpants <laughs> actually what i'm getting questions now that so insley and the president and others in charge are sort of saying hey we're going to turn the economy back on the question is like can we come to canlis in your sweatpants and brad and i did my brother and i discussed this like two days ago I was like, I think we have to say yes. Like we, 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 so now we have a merchandise line, right? Merchandise, right? Like we make cheap sweatpants and they say no dress code for those that don't know, canless. And people are like, well, yeah, if I wear a sport coat and sweatpants and I'm like, yes, sport coat, sweatpants, you want to come in done. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, that's the idea is that um, I think there's no limit on creativity um, in a time such as this, when everything is up for renegotiation. And I'm just not saying we're going to turn into a, a CSA delivery company or late night bingo company or cheap sweatpants and goofy t-shirts. Um, but for the time being, each of those is helping us stay employed. This is bringing in revenue in the restaurant and it's allowed us to not lay anyone off. Um, it's allowed us to not have to rely on outside funds and, um, uh, we're proud of that and we also think that we're serving the city we think we're doing a service so um so yeah there's been an, an, a series of of um ideas that you wouldn't expect for a brand like ours and yet there's a piece of this that just I, um in so many ways canless feels more canless now than ever i feel like we are leaning into um, our community i feel like we're turning towards the people around us even in a time and obviously we need to stay six feet away, even at a time when we feel more alone as a community. This was sort of our way to say, okay, six feet away and, and quarantine does not mean that we're not together. It does not mean that we're not a tight knit bond of people who are going through this thing. And if a canless dinner in a box on your doorstep can encourage you in that direction, then that's what we want to do. So that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> and it's kind I, I of working. I, yeah. I, th I think it's amazing. And I, I, I love how you're talking about one of the key outcomes that you guys were managing to was not having to uh, lay off employees, you know, in a time when uh, unfortunately many businesses are having to make that decision. And I, I just think it says so much about who and your bro you and your brother are, that that's, that that's the way that you prioritize the things that you've done. Um, one of the questions I got on Twitter was specifically about this subject. And, and, you know, for, for those that don't know, you also, chose not to lay off uh, even the piano player that plays at the restaurant and have been really? streaming have been stream, <laughs> streaming music with the piano players. Yeah. Like, how's, how's that going? Are, are you it's so it? cool. You know, this was an idea that came from one of our guests and he said, I missed the piano player. I, I wish you guys would live stream it. And we were like, that's amazing because I had just called them a couple of days earlier and said, you guys, obviously delivering dinner is not going to keep you in pool. Or do you want to be drivers? And they were like, yeah, we'll drive. Like, you know, this is a period where anyone's thankful for a job. And, and then we were like, well, wait a second. Yeah, it's pretty cool if we can deliver the music too. And so uh, Jason Colt came in with all his gear. That's our piano player. He's like kind of like a gearhead and he had a little soundboard, a couple of microphones. He's like, I think I can figure this out. So um, there's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people watching. Uh, that turned into bingo on Friday nights that followed. And we have a few thousand people watching that every night. And again, it's like, what business do we have 
playing bingo. We just give these things out for free. And I think there's, um, there's something human about it. And there's something that just, it's like, we're just a restaurant. We're still here. And, it, and I think it feels good for people to see that things are carrying on. I, there's something inside all of our spirit that wants to endure, that wants to be like, hey, put me in the fight. Like, we got this. And um, and I think that it's, there's something about you flip open your computer and you set it on your dinner table and Jason's sitting there playing to you and it, it's either reassuring or it's humorous or it's calming or it just it might be beautiful, whatever the case may be, it is an encouraging thing and it's the internet, so it's free, right? So it's cool, I don't know. We're not really a technology company, it's never been our jam in the past, but um, we're figuring it out, yeah. I think we screwed up the microphones like 11 days in a row. I, just, I didn't know microphones could be so difficult. I'm gonna just plug it in and like stick it in the piano and Jason's like, no. Where are we getting there? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, uh, with, with like hearing that story, you know, just hearing about the, the change to the business model, like as you, as you guys are thinking about, you know, at some point, the, at some point the world's gonna be back to some, some semblance of normal. Yeah. Like as, as you guys have gone through this experience over the last couple of months, what, what pieces of it do you think carry forward? What things have you guys learned that, that are fundamentally gonna change the way that you do business going forward? There's a couple of negative ones. Uh, we learned that we all love having Saturday and Sunday off. So we're just a Monday through Friday daytime <laughs> operation. Um, we all love going to bed on time. So this is going to like negatively impact fine dining forever. <laughs> uh, my maitre d' is like, I'm up at 6 a.m. and I love it. You know, and I'm like, oh no, I need you awake at 11 and p.m. And, um, but um, there's some really neat pieces too. I think, um, you know, all these servers driving around the city and going into their, we're not going into their homes, but instead of people coming into our home, we're going to their homes and seeing the guests and the breadth of guests and the variety of them, we're able to serve way more of the city now than we've ever been able to do. And basically because we're serving an enchilada for 40 bucks instead of, you know, fancy, fancy dinner for 140 and so um there's a piece of that of like that as um that we really like there's a piece of it that um makes us feel more connected to the neighborhoods around us and to our neighbors and to this city in a way that when you just stay inside your restaurant every night and let them come to you you don't have that and so that has been sort of had this endearing um effect on us and so yeah, I don't know, uh, you know, maybe, yes, the economy will go back to um, a newer and better version of normal, I hope, eventually. I think that's that onus is on all of us as citizens and business leaders and to say, okay, let's piece it back together. Let's leave the broken parts in the past and let's do a little bit better in the future. And I think from a restaurant standpoint, we're asking ourselves the question, what does service look like now? Um, but from a personal standpoint, asking the question, how do I use this opportunity, which is, a I know, a scary word for this, um, this forced stillness, this brokenness, the devastation. How do we use, like, this period right now? How do I let it affect me? Like, what do I change? And I'll be honest, in early March, there's a lot I didn't like about myself, and maybe I can use this as an opportunity to make myself a little bit better. And so if I can do that, if our company can do that as people and as an organization, then I think... Um, I don't know. I just think that's a good place to start. So I don't know, you know, yesterday um, my ex writer was like, why don't we do a car wash? I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> We're moving further away from fine dining, but I don't know. I kind of like the idea. So I don't know if Canlis becomes a car wash. Um, I think we get back to doing what we do, but I do think it's taught us to think creatively. Um, it's been an exercise in a work ethic. This has been the hardest thing we've ever done. I have never, we've done some crazy things in the company and not, not like this. And, um, and it's taught us to appreciate one another in a different way. And those are lessons that'll carry us forward. I think long into the future. Yeah. Well, you guys take our cars anyway, so you might as well, might as well wash them when we get there. <laughs> uh, right. I mean, that didn't, that kind of went through our mind. We're like if people are picking up boxes, why don't we just wash their cars? So we only have one hose at Canlo. So I'm like, yeah, how many cars can we watch with one hose? Like, well, the rinsing is the fast part. And now I got everyone that wants to be the rinser. Nobody wants to be the soap person. But we'll figure yeah. that out. You know, these are small, small business challenges. These are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So as sp speaking of other small businesses, I mean, I I obviously small businesses across the country have been disproportionately impacted by what's, ha what's happened with COVID. And I think small businesses in your industry, restaurateurs, people in the service industry, probably been impacted more than anybody else. Yeah. Um, it's so great to hear how you guys have, you know, helped, you know, evolved, adapted your business to overcome some of those challenges. But may maybe for other restaurateurs or service industry owners out there, like what, what are some of the you know, pearls of wisdom advice that you'd have on uh, how you implement some of these, these new strategies? Um, what, are, what are some of the, the kind of key learnings that you would, yeah. you would uh, pass on to others? I think the first thing I'd want them to know, particularly in the restaurant business, but sort of any small business owner, like this is just me and my brother, right? Our wives are involved. We got kids at home. Like this is, we're a small business, but it's big business to us. Like these are our livelihoods. And I wouldn't want them to think that Canlis had it all figured out. We don't. Um, this has been scary. Um, this has been, uh, we feel like we don't know what we're doing. Um, we don't know what we're doing. We, we've started, uh, we're on our fourth business model inside of eight weeks. And um, that's not overstating at all what's going on. It's like, let's do this, let's move. And um, now let's do this and let's move. It feels like we jumped off of a sinking ship onto a lifeboat and off of a lifeboat onto another lifeboat and off of another lifeboat on another lifeboat. And, um, and at the same time, I, I guess I would want people to hear that it's possible. It's doable. And, um, and more than that, um, the way that our staff has rallied around us, this isn't about me and Brian. This is about 115 people saying, you guys jump and we will push you even further. Like you jump and we'll come with you. Like we'll make this happen. Like just give us a chance to, so to see the staff work twice as hard in a time that's a lot harder to be working, right? Um, it's just emotionally, like you're not getting restored the same way at home reading headlines that we used to be. And so to see the staff gather around you and then to see the community, I can't tell you how encouraging it's been to people. I just went for a walk down the street and the guy was like, thanks for doing the dinners. You know, it's like, that matters. Like it fills us up. It's like, okay. Like, and so to have the city kind of come behind you and say, thank you. And you guys keep going. It's no different than playing in a home stadium or playing in an away stadium. When you're in a home and everyone's cheering, it matters, the big deal. And so um, I would just encourage other businesses to know that you're in your hometown and uh, this is your crew and, um, and, and to go for it. Um, both the options in front of us are, are scary. They just are. Uh, trying something is scary and doing nothing is scary. And for our own little company, we thought it was riskier to do nothing than to do do something. And then for many other companies, the, the reciprocal is true. And so um, it's not just a plug and play thing, particularly in restaurants. Each little restaurant is so unique and has such a little microcosm of what makes that thing either work or not work. Um, but having the guts to, to just try something, I think it like always earns my respect. And, and I've seen so many people in this town, other restaurateurs and other small business owners, just our little, you know, flourish, our little flower shop just said, we're allowed to open and we're going to do this thing and we're going to deliver. And they're, they're crushing it. Like she's making flowers and his, her husband is delivering them and sent one to my mom for Mother's Day. And it's like the first time in a few years. <laughs> I got it this time, right? And so um, I don't know. I just that's encouraging to me. And I think there's. I think if we start looking around us and finding the stories of the people who've got this and taking our cues off of them instead of um, instead of other things, there's a lot of scary things out there. And I, I, my own personal thing, I wake up and I just start with like, okay, is there anything I could be thankful for? Because um, otherwise, in my head, it is too discouraging. It's too despairing. It's too. Um, it's just sort of depressing. But if I can say, okay, the sky hasn't fallen, I'm healthy. Um, what can I do today? That, um, yeah, I don't know. That's how we've been doing it. And, and again, like I said, we've been so blessed. We've been so fortunate. And um, yeah, I just have a lot of gratitude for our team and for, and for the city. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of gratitude to you, you know, both uh, for doing this with us today, uh, but also as, as being a member myself of the Puget Sound community. Uh, I, I reflect everything uh, that you've been hearing from others in the community. And I'm so proud of what you guys have done uh, as big pillar members of, of the Seattle and Puget Sound area. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for doing that. If you're here in the Seattle area, please support 
Canlis and other and other small businesses, uh, especially right now during this crisis, uh, they need they need it more than anything. Thank you so much for what you're doing for your employees uh, to make this as is a uh, you know comfortable as an experience for them as it can be because it's 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 scary for anybody when they you know turn on the news every day and see and see the job reports. So I think what you're doing is making a huge huge difference. Thank so. Uh, Thank you again, Mark. Uh, that wraps up our first episode of Taking Care of Business. Uh, I, again, please encourage everybody to support your local small businesses across the country, and we'll be back next week uh, featuring another great business from the Midwest. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike.